It is a thrill for us to be doing Bible study with you. Thank you for joining us here in Book by Book. I'm Richard Buse, joined here by Paul Blacker, my colleague, and by Alec Mateer. And we're sitting together in the beautiful garden room of a fine Christian household in Ealing, the suburb of London, England. And the sunshine blazing down on us. We've also got the thrill of the Bible in front of us, Book of Isaiah is what we're doing. And we come to our fourth study, which we're going to entitle Glory to the Righteous One, by whom we mean Christ, of course. And chapters 21 to 27 is rather a long section. We can't cover it all. But we'll do what we can, and you can fill out the rest when you take up the book-by-book -book study guide on Isaiah, which will be available. Please use that if you've got one. And uh, why don't I start at chapter 26? I'm going to read the first four verses of that chapter, a song of praise. Mm. Here's Isaiah writing. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God makes salvation its walls and ramparts. Open the gates that the righteous nation may enter, the nation that keeps faith. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord, is the rock eternal. That's Isaiah. And here we are then as we come to these important chapters, 21 to 27. Actually, let's go back now to chapter 21 where our section starts because Isaiah's horizon it seems to extend far beyond Judah and Jerusalem as we learnt in our previous study. He's looking out to the deserts, to the east and the south. Let's work out what he sees here, Paul, in chapter 21. Yeah, I, I, I love this because, and I like what Alex said when we were thinking in a previous study about how he, he entitles it the desert by the sea. And it's almost as if he's maybe on holiday down by the Red Sea when he, and he's thinking about this looking bigger picture and yeah. beyond. And he sees, well, he sees um, all, all away to the east with Babylon. And as again, this, and, and then he sees Arabia and Edom. So it's really to the east and south of Judah and he sees all these nations but now it's got this sort of bigger longer term picture to it than it had the first time he mentioned these things and he can see it's more again he's giving us a way to understand history in a bigger way so he's posting a watch and what does he see and it's this brilliant bit that's picked up in Revelation chapter 14 verse 8 down in verse 9, Babylon has fallen, Babylon has fallen. All the image of its gods lies shattered on the ground. And it's this big sense. So he's already said, look, Babylon is going to fall. But now it's this bigger sense that that's to do with the meaning of history itself and all these gods that are, are going to fall. And then, then against Edom, there's that sense of night and then morning and night and then morning and night. It's like it goes on and on and on, but there is an end. There is an end, but history seems to just go on and on. Same with Arabia. Like the, all, even their great strength, the archers and things, even that will be lost too. So he's, he's looking around and he says, look, I can see the way history's going that these great empires will fall. Even the gods fall of these empires and their religions. But there is an end. He can see it all. So he's kind of giving a, a view of history, how to understand where everything's going. And he still feels the pressure of it, doesn't he? Very much. I mean, my heart falters, chapter 21, oh, verse yeah. 4. Fear makes me tremble. The twilight I longed for has become a horror to me. So he can feel the pressure of it all, but he's still got this vision. Mm. It, it, it is fascinating. Well, now in chapter, I mean, in chapter 22, if we look at that, the focus I see is back on Jerusalem. What was going wrong there, Alec Mateer? I mean, why say, well, verse 15, would God replace the palace administrator? What's important about that? It, it sounds as though they were having a national holiday to celebrate the completion of Hezekiah's tunnel. Mm. And lots of people nowadays have been to Jerusalem and they've either walked through the I've tunnel been through that. Yeah. yeah, or seen at least one end of it or the other. It was a marvellous piece of engineering, mm. terrific feat of engineering, the purpose of which was to bring a safe water supply within the city because Jerusalem was impregnable as far as walls and so on were concerned but it 
an enemy could stop the water with water supply, which was over ground, do you see, and therefore dry the city out and bring it to its knees that way. And Hezekiah solved that problem by building his famous tunnel and giving the city, giving the city a, a safe water supply. And Isaiah t- turn, comes out on this joyous national bank holiday and says, this is the unforgivable sin. Chapter 22, verse 14. And he, yes. Why? Why is it the unforgivable sin? It sounds like a great idea. Because it's telling God that he made a mistake. Okay. You see? The Lord chose Jerusalem to be the city where he would set his name. He chose it. Well, did he go wrong because there was no safe water supply? Uh. So if you live in Jerusalem, you either do what Hezekiah did, did and save yourself by works or else you trust in the Lord and save yourself by faith. The city compels you to it. And that's why the steward in charge was to be... That's right. The the existing steward, Shebna, and the expected steward, Eliakim, in different ways are subject to the same threat, to turn to ways of Mm. self-salvation. And... It's a terrible thing to tell God he made a mistake. <laughs> wow. And that's so, what it's but about. The, the actual turn, the actual telling him he made a mistake involved this way of self-salvation. Wow. Mm. Mm. Anything to add to that, Paul? I mean, that's fascinating that uh, they could have got it so wrong that it has to be drawn to attention by Isaiah. But Isaiah says that this is a sin that can find no atonement. Mm. Yeah, because I suppose that you can't make atonement if yeah. if you're saying I'm trusting in myself That's and right. I need to get security yeah. for myself. Yeah. Well, you can't you can't be forgiven for that because the whole yeah. way in which That's we find right. forgiveness is renouncing yeah. that. Yeah. That's, That's brilliant. Real. People get confused about yeah. Jesus' reference to the unforgivable sin. Mm. Well, there it is. There it is. It's trusting in yourself. Mm. As long as you trust in yourself, you can't be forgiven. Yeah. Wow. Challenging. Um, actually, as you move on, you were mentioning earlier about the east and the south. Oh, yeah. Well, now in chapter 23, it seems to be the turn of the north mm. and the west. There's wealthy, heathen, rich yeah. seaports of Tyronside, and there's rich merchants. Mm. Their future seems to be now in question here. Well, I suppose, I mean, if you're thinking in terms of trusting in your own ability and your own wealth and all that, Tyre and Sidon are incredibly powerful symbols of that. Because yes. the, these seaports, aren't they? And I think in, in, in military terms, they're almost impossible to conquer because yeah. they were out on that. And yet and they were really brilliant entrepreneurs and they got this trading empire. And it looks from this chapter, they'd sort of got uh, colonies of trading mm-hmm all around the Mediterranean, and we see references to, <laughs> you know, what, Egypt. What, what and we call a multinational. They're multinational companies, <laughs> that's what they are. I love yeah. that. Yeah. The multinational companies in Egypt and Spain, and everyone looks to them. Yeah. And, the br- and, and so, of course, they have enormous self-confidence. And, of course, they're centres of Baal worship, aren't they, and mm. all that sort of thing. And so the Lord's... <laughs> Having warned Jerusalem not to be trusting in their own ingenuity, he, then the prophecy turns to really the, the ultimate examples of trusting in your own ingenuity, Tyre and Sidon, and that they too will be judged and brought down to size, which is, you know, it's an incredible thing. Although I did find it amazing that at the end of that, you think, oh, well, that's it. There can be no hope for Tyre and Sidon. And yet somehow at the end, there's that little hint that even their yeah. profits and earnings could be turned to the where? use of the Lord. Now, where's that? that right at the end of the chapter in verse 18, like 18, isn't it? 18, yeah. It, ah, yes. it, yeah. So even there, it's as if there's still the door left ajar. I love that. Tyre is the only oracle in this section that is mentioned by name. Mm. Oh, the, yeah? o- the others are all cryptic references. And I, th- I, I think the purpose of that is to show that, as you might say, eschatology happens to real people. Ooh. You know, there are real people around when the great day of judgment comes mm. and the great commercial corrupter mm. will be there. Mm. It seems that all these kind of historical judgments are, are samples, of course, of the great day yeah. when everything that can be shaken yeah. will be shaken. Mm. I mean, if you, I noticed at verse 20, chapter 24, the word earth comes many, many mm. times. Yeah. 
See, the Lord is going to lay least the earth, the earth, verse 1. Yeah. Yeah. Then it's again, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, the earth yeah. is defiled. Yeah. Verse 6, a curse consumes the earth, earth's yeah. inhabitants. Yeah. Again, verse, oh, it's everywhere. Yeah. 17, 19, 20, 21, the earth. Would you like to comment a little bit about this, uh, Alec? As we look at chapter 24. Well, nowadays we talk about a global village, don't we? Mm. The, the whole globe, the whole earth is one global village. You, in everything affects everything else. Well, that's, that's the background to Isaiah 24. Uh, he started in chapter 13 with Babylon. And then in chapter 21, it became cryptic, but it was still there. And now in chapter 24, look what it is, verse 10, the city of confusion. What does your translation say? Uh, verse 10, the ruined city lies desolate, the entrance to every house is barred. Just, uh, it's, it's, it's the word that's used in Genesis, the whole earth was, as Hebrew says, tohu. The whole earth was without meaning, it was just a, a meaningless lump at that point. And, and, and man's efforts to create a global village will end with that creation of meaninglessness, the city where nothing means anything anymore. Oh, Alec, you take the cities of the world today. Yeah. You've been in some of those great cities. Yeah. Do you feel that the force of what Isaiah is saying affects those cities today? Yeah. Some measure. That's right. And the whole tendency of what's called postmodernism is heading towards an ultimate of meaninglessness. Mm. Wow. And man's best effort to create a global society will end up in a world that has no meaning anymore. Yeah. Where nothing makes sense, or as we might say, it doesn't add up. No, no. And then that day of global judgment when Christ returns, well, actually, we find it in chapter 25 and 26. Mm. I mean, that day will obviously be a day, well, it, it's, we learn it'll be a day of rejoicing for his people. Well, that's it. I mean, the. In chapter 24 itself, you have a pilgrimage from all the earth of singing pilgrims. Mm. They're on their way to the Zion of chapter 25, actually. Mm. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's right. Come Chap ye that love the Lord. Exactly. So the rejoicing aspect, I mean, it could be said that some of it is a, a version almost of some of the language here at least. It's perhaps a, a version of, of 1 Corinthians 15 with its True. mention of the resurrection. Mm. Oh, and confidence. Yeah. What do you think, Paul? I love that because you, you, I quite often when people say, oh, I, I, I really love the resurrection hope of the New Testament, and then they'll quote bits of 1 Corinthians 15 or bits mm. of right, Revelation 21. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now I'm like, whoa, 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 hang on, that's Isaiah. Yeah, yeah. go back to the source. That's like, all those are bits of Isaiah. 26, 19, <laughs> look at that. Oh, yeah. Put um, your, but your dead will live, oh. their bodies will rise, you who dwell in the, in the dust... Wake, Wake up, up and shout for joy. Mm. Yeah. Right. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. You'll make it fall on the spirits of the dead. Or oh, no, in chapter 25, oh, you get chapter, that. Yeah. Chapter 25. A yeah. feast of rich food for all peoples. A banquet of aged wine, best of meats, finest of wines. Marriage feast of the lamb territory, isn't and it? It's will, just... And he will swallow up death forever. Swallow up death forever. I mean, when Paul quotes that, people think the Apostle Paul invented that. And he's mm. like, no, I'm getting it mm. from Isaiah. No, no. And the sovereign Lord will wipe mm. away the tears from all right. faces. All the, that's Revelation 21 stuff. The, the day that uh, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15, Isaiah 25 was a scripture union passage. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> he must have done no, but you feel like this stuff is, I think it'd be great for people to get that excitement, a sense if you really want the, the fullest descriptions of our new creation future, go Get to Isaiah. Isaiah. Yeah. I mean, actually, the New Testament basically is saying, haven't you read Isaiah? <laughs> They're mm. kind of referring you back to Isaiah see, to get more of it. Here in Acts chapter 26, in verse 22, mm. Paul is saying to King Agrippa, I have had God's help to this very day. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses yes. said would happen. That's right. There it so, is. He's, it. He admits that he's only saying what Isaiah says. So I just say to people, sometimes people often ask me, what will it be like in the new creation? 
maybe the top tip is go and have a good read of Isaiah. He has these amazing passages. And we, could, we, we, we didn't have time to do Isaiah 11 in great depth, but Isaiah 11 has some wonderful things about that future. Mm. And here, that sense that death's gone, mm. a feast for everybody, marriage feast of the Lamb, and oh, just reading it, you long for it. And in our last few seconds together in this study, just a glance at uh, chapter 27. I mean, that future great day, we'll see the Lord dealing with all that opposes us. What's this about, verse 1, about Leviathan, Alec? Well, Leviathan, the gliding Leviathan serpent. Leviathan appears a few times in the Old Testament. In, in Job, at the end of Job, he's obviously a great sea monster and is... Uh, the fact that the Lord can subdue him is evidence of the Lord's almighty power. But earlier in Job, Leviathan is a mysterious force of chaos. Um, that's the best word I can think of at the moment anyway. He's a force of destruction. And uh, it's in that sense that Leviathan is used here. That reference is Job 3 verse 8. That here in Isaiah, I, Leviathan is used in that sense of the, the ultimate ultimate forces of destruction and chaos will be, will be slain by the Lord's sword. The Lord has a threefold sword. It's severe, great and strong. And Leviathan is the fleeing serpent, the twisted serpent and the reptile in the sea. A threefold enemy and a threefold sword. So is it that the chaotic, the chaos of the city that we heard about in 24, the yeah. meaninglessness yes. behind that is a that's, Leviathan, really? That's exactly so. Wow, that's powerful. Exactly. And it takes an Isaiah to see this and to tell us and to share his wonderful prophecy with us. And as we close off, we'll be coming back again to Isaiah next time round, of course. But for the moment, let's realise what a vigilant man uh, Isaiah was. And we need to cultivate such vigilance ourselves as we look at the cities of our world and what's going on in our world today and to do is well actually as the Lord commanded him in uh, chapter 21 uh, when we st almost started there with uh, what was it verse uh, verse 8 verse 8 where the lookout or you'd say I think from the Hebrew correctly it was a lion well I've got, the, I've got the new King James version here and he cried a lion now, the Hebrew simply says, a lion cried. And it's a description of the watchman, resolute, faithful, and strong. Lion that he was, he cried out. That's very good. Yeah. Like, a, like a lookout, certainly. Day after day, my Lord, I stand on the watchtower. Every night, I stay at my post. And that's as a, that ought to be us. If you look at our world, struggling, staggering at the times, but nevertheless aware, as Isaiah was, of what is truly happening. God bless you and thank you for sharing very much in the study. We'll meet again next time.